Um, in this session, we are going to look at questions of data ownership. Uh, we are going to look at what benefits and harms individuals and groups worldwide experience because of practices of measurement, collection, analysis, and application of different forms of health data, and how uh, new forms of ownership challenge existing ideas about uh, individual privacy, et cetera. And we've asked the speakers to bring all these issues back to questions about uh, uh, governance more broadly and how data can be used for market expansion, commodification of health, and how global governance can be used to harness and regulate um, ownership of data in the public interest. So I think it'll be a very exciting session, just like the other ones, especially because this is a highly interdisciplinary panel. We have uh, an anthropologist, a sociologist, a philosopher, and, and then a political scientist commenting. So I think we'll just start um, uh, right away with Susan Erickson. Susan Erickson is a medical anthropologist who studies highly complex political and economic systems that shape our experiences of health. Uh, she's professor of global health at the Faculty of Health Sciences, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver in Canada, and is going to talk to us today about um, why big data scientists demand private cell phone data during the West African Ebola yeah. outbreak. Thank you, Susan. Welcome. So this is the presentation, and I just wanted to let people know that um, it was finally published, um, and it was promised elsewhere before I joined the conference last year, and it's now in uh, Medicine and Anthropology Theory. It only came out two weeks ago, so if you're interested in what I presented last year, there it is. There you'll find it. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about today, but I um, just want to say that in 15 minutes, I again only have time enough to depress you, and um, <laughs> although I tend to be a rather um, cynical optimist, uh, and I hope we can have some good conversations afterwards. Um, what I have found when I start actually doing forensics on things like big data, cell phone use, and um, promises, the hype about uh, big data relative to Ebola contagion, is that when you start to peel things back, uh, you realize that it's not quite what the, the hype isn't very well supported by the empirical data. So I will be presenting a lot of the empirical data rather quickly. Um, and uh, because 15 minutes, that's really all that I have time to do. So it was a project uh, sponsored by the government of Canada, asking a bunch of different questions about health data and governance, but at the heart of it was really the question of what do data do? So in the world, what are, what's the work that data is doing? Um, I am an anthropologist. Uh, and so I was using the ethnographic method made, uh, I've been working actually in Sierra Leone uh, uh, for about 30 years um, and have lived for like, you know, two years at a time uh, in different parts of Sierra Leone. So um, it was relatively easy to do uh, uh, ethnographically and uh, uh, informed uh, data collection, um, taking up residents in neighborhoods and uh, really speaking the language, um, both Creole and Mende. Um, which is a standard of anthropological practice. Um, just to remind you as to where Sierra Leone is in West Africa, it was one of three countries that experienced um, the 2014-2016 uh, Ebola outbreak. And um, this is a paper that was published um, on the topic that I'm going to be talking about today uh, in Medical Anthropology Quarterly last year. And it's a critical analysis of big data global health technology and my conclusion, to just skip to that so you know where I'm going uh, as I start telling some of these stories, is that big data did not work to contain Ebola, um, and the efforts to use big data actually wasted time and social capital during an epidemic. And I really think this issue of opportunity cost is important to pay attention to when we're actually assessing and making our calculations of uh, the work that data does, the work that technology does, um, when we're actually trying to figure out whether or not we ever want to use these kinds of technologies again. And the issue of whether it's ethical to do uh, technology and data experimentation um, during an epidemic is, of course, obviously uh, uh, implicit, I think, in, in this um, analysis. So the hype and misapplication of big data capability in epidemics is, uh, are part of the problems uh, that I identify in this work. Um, the hubris of computational epidemiologists and by that I mean epidemiologists who are using big data. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's not only is it an industry, but it is, of course, uh, in terms of the machines and systems and capital and capital financing that are involved to set up uh, how you actually process big data. It's an enormous investment. 
Um, but the hubris of comp computational epidemiologists and their assumptions of what the data will do, um, I found to be a, a very interesting cultural artifact um, of this particular project. Uh, the erasure of local knowledge, um, you know, even in our talks today, I've heard people refer to poor countries with the assumption that there is a lack. And there is often, I mean, it's, it's said by people who have maybe never been to the country that they're talking about. And I do find this um, particularly, um, I will say, offensive. And um, uh, certainly when Sierra Leoneans are sitting in an audience and they're part of a big data team, they are also having the same reaction. And so I think the kind of, um, uh, well, widespread assumption that there's always a lack of capacity is just plain ignorant. And the way that we actually unpack that is to do the work um, as best we can, both Global North and Global South uh, social scientists, to figure out what's actually going on. Um, there's also the issue of the ethics of humanitarian experimentation, as I already touched on, and the uh, ethics of privacy and patient rights. I want to take a breath here and just acknowledge that there's a long-standing, um, centuries-old tension between what's permissible during a crisis, a health crisis or epidemic, and that uh, you know it's permissible and privacy violating both at the same time, from a public health point of view, to put people into quarantine, to isolate them, to keep them from their their kin, um, in order that a contagion doesn't spread. So. Uh, you know, historically, the public health sector has claimed the authority, and when we're talking about strong states being able to claim that authority uh, to quarantine and track contagious groups of individuals, although with HIV-AIDS, this was of course contested, um, when uh, HIV-AIDS advocates, there's a word missing there, have fought for patients' rights, choice, and dignity and care. Um, in the 2014-2016 West African Ebola uh, outbreak, though, the privacy rights, care rights, and the rights to a dignified burial uh, were again called into question as if none of that work had ever been done. And again, the fact that it, people are able to take advantage in places where there's um, not strong states actually um, fortifying those kinds of, of rights and responsibilities is just something I think that needs to be part of our conversation. So about halfway through the outbreak, there was, a, these are just two examples, one from CNBC and one from PRI, of uh, how big data was actually geared to uh, help stop the Ebola outbreak. And the, the articles themselves were actually very, very similar, although they were, whoever was distributing them via media was doing an incredibly efficient job of getting uh, this expectation out there that big data was an answer to actually solving the problem of the Ebola outbreak. And this is how it was supposed to work. Um, in 2014, it was supposed to be a scale up of a 2012 malaria study and it was to be applied to Ebola. And in that malaria study, a cell phone was supposed to work to locate a person, um, but in, in the applied case, it was to Ebola. Tracking a phone was supposed to enable tracking a person. So there's the assumption that a phone is a person. Um, big data in this case was the call detail record, the CDR um, data, and it was data from over 14 million cell phones used to show that when Kenyans with malaria travel to new places, malaria pre prevalence increases. Now I'm laughing a little bit because anybody who's worked anywhere um, knows that with regards to malaria, if there's more people in an area that have malaria, there will be a higher prevalence of malaria. And so what they were basically showing is that when people um, migrated for labor, that there was a reduction in the place that they left and an increase in the place where they arrived, <laughs> which was a big dog, right? Um, but this was heralded um, in the halls of Harvard um, as a, a profound technology and a lot of awards were won by this particular research team. So they went in with that kind of um, prestigious uh, positioning in the world system, which is another thing I wanna bring up relative to the kinds of power relations that we're talking, to, uh, talking about so that there are institutions, not just countries, but institutions with particular kinds of privilege that end up getting a kind of carte blanche when they go into places like Sierra Leone. And ministries are not often in the position of saying, Harvard, no, you don't get to do, you, you, we were not in the position to say that you can't do what it is you're saying that you wanna do because we trust that what you have to say is superior to what we know about the problem. And that in and of itself is problematic. <coughs> 
Um, but that's just, just a part of what we're going to be talking about here. Just so you know, um, I do think that part of this project that we're engaging in has to be this forensics where we can actually say what, how it is that a cell phone can um, be uh, a signal for a larger system to actually find a particular person. It, it, that's the specifics for this case. But what I'm talking about is that as social scientists, we actually do the work so that we get quite granular about what the work is, what the data is. Um, just so in this case, um, people's digital footprints remain after leaving a time-coded trail from their phones via the pings at a cell phone tower. So there's constant communication. I mean, now it's maybe more well known than it certainly was when I started doing this work. But there's constant communication between us and cell phone towers, us and servers, us when we go into a store and they're following, they're, they're, they're seeing which uh, 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 aisle we're stopping in to shop for what. Um, but just that there is this trail that's left. And this call detail record includes things like, I hope you can see this, those, uh, it can include a whole bunch of things depending on uh, the telecommunications company and what they've decided actually to select as their variables. But in this case, this is just an example of a call detail record that included the uh, latitude and longitude of the site where uh, somebody made the call. So you can imagine, or so people were imagining, that a person's movement could then be plotted out based on where the longitude and latitude was of their cell phone pings. So in this case, um, the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, in the middle of, this, of the Ebola outbreak, uh, went to the UN, uh, Sierra Leonean Ministry of Health and Sanitation, the Sierra Leonean Office of the President, and pleaded for an act of, uh, uh, that, that they needed to engage uh, in data philanthropy. They needed to advocate data philanthropy um, to the cell phone company. So they needed, so they basically asked the government and the UN to ask, uh, act as an intermediary um, to get the cell phone companies in Sierra Leone to uh, engage in data philanthropy, to give them the uh, CDR data to do emergency public health work. So I'm going to be talking about three problems. One is that there's opportunity cost during health emergencies, especially in poor communities, because attention to some folks when you're working in a, a resource fixed or limited or scarce area means that it, other folks or other problems don't get attention. So I hope you can appreciate that um, you know, this act of, of begging the um, cell phone companies for their data meant that the tele telecommunications companies, the UN and these ministries and the Office of the President were paying attention to the folks from Harvard rather than actually setting up with the telecommunications agencies, uh, companies, the um, other sites where they actually should have been focusing on getting good telecommunication systems moving. A second problem is that um, global public health data advocates like uh, these uh, computational epidemiologists who made the data philanthropy plea have argued that CDR data are anonymized and therefore not subject to data protection laws. But there's such an irony in this that is so easily undone if you're at all logical. Um, CDR is never completely um, anonymized because the calls are identified number one, where they took place, but also to whom they took place, the number that was called, the number that, was, uh, that received the call. Um, and in fact, the very fact that they were not anonymized uh, was why the computational epidemiologists wanted the data to begin with, because the assumption was, was that if they got the data from the CDR, right, they could figure out where the person was. Um, so, there's also this question of, of course, data privacy protection authority and its enforcements. And in scenarios like this, where does that enforcement of privacy lie? Um, because some of the data, or, uh, some of the telecommunications companies, in fact, did turn over the data, um, or at least some packets of data from both Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia. They had actually stricter data protection laws, and it went a little bit differently. Um, I'm going to introduce another, I hope it doesn't seem too far-fetched, but this is actually part of the conversation that I, when I started doing this uh, research that, that I was having with people, particularly in the U.S. military. And this was 
the idea that you would use the phone to track a person until they became untrackable, if they went too far into the, the bush, these are the conversations. And so at that point, and this didn't happen in exactly the way people were imagining, but they were talking about using drones, and who knows if this is coming, um, but using drones for uh, capture and containment. And you know, there's all kinds of things that you can actually put on a drone, like heat seeking, recognition, <laughs> And just to give you an idea of what you might be able to see of a drone, this is a shot of Magazine Wharf in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And you might not be able to detect, detect it from where you're sitting, but you can actually, actually see people. Here's another one, and you can very easily see people when the light is a little bit better for you. There's a lot of people under that tree to the right. Um, and then, of course, what we were talking about with regards to facial recognition, you can start to see how there is a technology of surveillance that is um, a lot of people are thinking in terms of how they will uh, devote these uh, technologies to uh, health. Um, you know, some of them, I've actually seen them come into compounds uh, that I've been in, and I can tell you on the first level, people freak out because they don't know what it is. This flying machine, it's not a bird, it's not. Um, so there's also that kind of violation, and the fact that. Uh, helicopters uh, were deployed in particularly, I will say, murderous ways during the war in Sierra Leone, which was not too long ago. It's in uh, most people's recent memory. Um, these are not innocent vehicles flying around in people's neighborhoods. There's just too many associations of the terrible things that happened when they had you know, bigger uh, vehicles flying around in their neighborhood. So the, what the US military was imagining was that there would be someone with a cell phone who would, uh, they would track them until you know, they, they'd lost track of them, at which point the drones would take over, and at which point they would then be somehow herded into a vehicle. So you can see how problematic it gets. Now, as far as I know, this later scenario did not happen, but I introduce it here because I think part of our responsibility also as social scientists is to imagine and anticipate future use of certain technologies, especially when there's so much money to be made. And there's so much money in military technologies. And once wars are over, there need to be new markets for where these things get used. So I want to, if I have even a moment left, talk about a problem number three, and that is the mechanisms of the using big data to stop a bullet premise that was flawed in three ways. And um, quoted in, in a Nature article by Amy Maxman, who, if you know her, she's an amazing journalist who writes for Nature. Um, and she wrote a very nice, and I would say even-handed piece about surveillance science. But she did um, generously quote me as saying, this wasn't even logical. What they were suggesting wasn't even logical for a bunch of reasons that if they had thought to ask any Sierra Leonean or any anthropologist working in Sierra Leone, they would have been able to actually figure out why it, this plan that they had was not going to work. And the, one of the first reasons is that big data did not work and could not work in the way that they were imagining it because so, uh, phones are not people. Um, they are not beacons of unique selves. Um, in the same way that Maureen mentioned that sometimes uh, phones will belong to a single family or a single community. Um, so you might have a single phone for 45 people. Now the flip side of that is that a lot of professionals in Freetown will have as many as five phones because they want to have a phone per network because it's so much cheaper to call within networks. So it's really, un it's, it's very common to see somebody open up their briefcase or their purse and they've got five cell phones in there. Um, and if they're not wealthy enough to have five cell phones, they almost always have at least three to five uh, SIM cards. So you see teenagers just flipping out the SIM cards in order to call whoever they need to call as long as they're within network. Another reason why big data didn't work is that the model itself was just not a match. And you know, in the case of the malaria Kenyan model that these computational epidemiologists were using, it was retrospective um, and it tracked people from home to work. And it was based actually on data estimates of prevalence, of malaria prevalence as opposed to, when we look at the case for Ebola, um, in order to do Ebola containment, of course, it requires the exact person in the exact location. It requires a, some version of contact tracing in the absence of a vaccine. Um, so that these were not equivalent cases. And this is why you know, Amy Max, Maxman ended up using that quote, that there, 
It wasn't even logical if they had sat down and actually worked through why them getting the data from the telecommunications company was not going to be enough to use big data to solve the problem. And then, of course, the, the third and so completely obvious point is that when you look at cell phone coverage, especially in the area where Ebola first broke out, there wasn't much. It was completely spotty. So how is it that they were going to be able to use, number one, this model that didn't work in an area that didn't have cell phone coverage? So in the absence of a vaccine in widespread use, um, I have to leave you with what did work. And of course, you're going to get some anthropological rah-rah here, so I'm warning you. Um, because this understanding of social vectors, and the WHO ended up ultimately admitting this. In September of 2014, they sent out um, a message to, on their listserv about all the approaches that they've taken so far hadn't worked and they really needed another way into the problem. And that was the point, actually, that a lot of UK um, anthropologists were the first to get their foot in the door because the, the way that it was actually spreading um, was through the funeral practices that ultimately, over time, became modified. Sierra Leoneans were completely open to that as long as they could continue to have the kinds of relationships with their ancestors, that there be a preservation of the relationships with their ancestors, that people be um, buried in particular ways, in particular directions, um, with particular prayers said. Um, and then with regards to home health care, a lot of people were afraid to go to the Ebola treatment units and for lots of reasons. And so a lot of people were keeping their Ebola sick family members at home. Um, this modified kind of uh, personal protection equipment, PPE, uh, it, it originally um, the WHO absolutely refused to disperse any information. If you can think about this, no information coming out of the WHO relative to uh, how to protect yourself if in fact you were somehow taking care of somebody with Ebola, that ended up changing when they realized that people were not bringing their, um, their relatives to the treatment centers. Um, what also worked, and this brings up a, actually quite a different point, um, is uh, the issue of contact tracing. And uh, this was actually taken up largely by Sierra Leoneans. There were over 10,000 Sierra Leoneans who ultimately became contact tracers. Now there's two things here. Um, the money from DFID, for example, had to be um, distributed to people who had been vetted by DFID personnel. They sent two people to vet 10,000 Sierra Leoneans. Now, these people didn't speak Creole. They didn't speak any of the local languages. Um, you can imagine how slow going that would be if you, just but under any conditions, much less um, in a, case, uh, a situation like Ebola. Um, the other piece to know about this is that the contact tracers, as well as the people doing the burials, were largely unpaid. Um, some people for as long as a year after, some people were never paid um, for the work that they did, even though they were the ones at risk. And Susan Shepler has written a wonderful article about who ate the Ebola money. And it's, a, it's from the perspective of Sierra Leoneans who saw all these public health um, Folks getting flown into Sierra Leone and staying at very nice uh, hotels on the beach, um, making a lot of per diem a day, as well as consultancy money in addition. Um, and they weren't even getting paid because they hadn't been uh, vetted quickly enough. So um, I thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll stop here. Thank you, Susan. It was very interesting to listen to uh, you discuss the hubris of uh, big data and how big data really failed where more uh, simple methods might have worked better. And I think one of the themes that we could pick up later in the discussion was this thing that you introduced about uh, the whether we have a responsibility to imagine and anticipate future uses of technology. That was a, a, an interesting thing. So now we're going to pass on uh, to Mary Ebeling, uh, who is a sociologist of science, technology, and medicine um, at Drexel University. And uh, I'm very excited to listen to your presentation, not least because your a book um, on uh, healthcare and big data is described as an ethnographic noir. Um, so um, without further ado, please welcome Mary. <laughs> 
everyone. Thank you very much for having me. And um, I'm going to try to follow up all of the great um, panels that have gone um, before before me. Um, and uh, so I'm basically my previous work was an ethnographic noir, um, and it was a very personal story about kind of my experience of being um, where my data, and it was specifically not even my health data, but kind of inferences about my health through consumer data that was collected on me without my, my knowing it, um, come, came back to haunt me. Um, so my current work, I'm looking, um, I'm looking more at what I'm going to be talking about today because I took the title of our panel quite literally, like who is collecting the, our data, who is owning our data, what are they doing it, to it. Um, so I'm looking, um, I'm going to be talking today about some of those um, players in the United States who are um, collecting and innovating upon data, health data in particular, um, and how the implications of um, the U.S. Uh, medical capitalist system has for kind of the broader global um, health markets and health data. Okay, so um, during a, a panel at Health Data Palooza, a meeting sponsored by Academic Health, a U.S.-based healthcare industry and policy organization that promotes open data science initiatives in healthcare and medicine. An audience member stood up and declared that patient data is the new oil that is driving 20, 21st century healthcare. And that because of its value, value, its immense value, it should be liberated. In fact, patient data is so valuable to medical science, it really should be considered a natural public resource and, is, and it is un, um, immoral, even unethical, if that natural resource were to remain locked up in the database, in, in databases because of um, patient privacy regulations. And they were, because it was, Health Data Palooza takes place every year in Washington, D.C. They were specifically talking about the U.S. context. These data, the speaker, the speaker argued, must be free to do good. The musical festival-like atmosphere at Health Data Palooza, there was a famous music fest called Lollapalooza. Yeah, so um, quickly evaporated when another audience member chimed in to remind everyone that this valuable fossil fuel running the healthcare industry was in fact made up of the crushed bones dreams and traumas of millions of patients, and that the raw, that raw natural resource, once it was refined and, and a analyzed and distributed, was not given back to the patient in the, in the form of improved health outcomes or life-saving drugs. And as previous panelists have reiterated this over and over again today. Um, <clears throat> and at least in the context of American medical capitalism, but was either considered the prospector's asset and closely guarded, or it was uh, an innovated upon that was sold as a commodity onwards. As the social, social political conditions of the data co economy inevitably mark and shape the objects that it produces, patient-derived data assets, these commodities are extracted under duress without consent or compensation, and thus so marked. The conditions uh, that these uh, extractive conditions around health data certainly reverberate beyond the U.S. healthcare system. And as many have already uh, presented today, um, these asymmet asymmetrical relationships uh, in terms of health data are, re are being reproduced over and over again in the global south. So what has become now an empty platitude that patient, um, patient, power, patient empowerment through health data, which, which at least in the U.S. context was originally used to kind of rally public resources um, in the early days, days, in the early years of digitalization of clinical data, 
is now no more than a marketing bid to sell publics on the widespread collection, ownership, and commodification of our health data by multinational corporate interests. The private accumulation of patient data is enabled by policymakers, particularly in the United States, who pass legislation that support the um, monopolistic ownership of health data, all under the marketing guise that data will deliver patient-centered care or enable patients to take control over their, over their health. The promise that digital technologies, open data and data analytics, um, such as AI, will solve some of the most vexing questions in medical science and will make healthcare more accessible, affordable, and equitable, in fact, hides the ongoing structural inequalities and injustices, uh, not only in the U.S. healthcare system, but globally, as we've already seen today. So today, I am going to um, briefly talk about uh, who um, is collecting and innovating upon patient data. And I, I want to kind of very lightly kind of understand this or talk about this through a global systems theory viewpoint where medical capitalism in the United States endeavors to maintain a core and periphery power dynamic um, through this collection and ownership and innovation um, on, on, data, on patient data um, and kind of understand it how it operates in the U.S. context and understand that this kind of core and periphery relationship, of course, we've already seen today, um, is a global a dynamic. <clears throat> so um, this extraction of the raw materials uh, of patient data from the peripheries, so in the U.S. context it would be patients themselves as well as in the global south, um, to the core where a monopoli monopolistic interest can realize the value of that data for shareholders in these multinational corporations. And the American legislative processes where corporations literally write the laws that govern and regulate them help to reinforce rather than disrupt, which is a favorite <laughs> word of Silicon Valley, um, these, health, these ongoing health inequalities, um, uh, not only here in the U.S. Um, in the core, but also in the peripheries. Um, in the global south. Far from more equitable outcomes for, for more patients, these legislative processes establish large data oceans for the global companies um, that are based in the U.S. Uh, to draw upon. So for example, um, I wrote about a, um, a bill that has not passed into law but was written in whole cloth by one of the largest and most powerful data collectors uh, probably globally, and it's not Google. <laughs> uh, it's Experian. Um, and they, they actually has, have this bill on the books. Um, it's not passed um, into law yet. So generally my research has focused on data and information economies as they've developed in the U.S., um, which is probably uh, the most unequal, fragmented, and expensive healthcare systems in the world. So we famously spend 18% of GDP in the United States on healthcare. Um, and part of that expense is because of these lobbying efforts by industry. Um, I think there was some research that was out a few years ago that showed I think about 30% of the cost of healthcare in the United States is due to uh, corporate lobbying. Um, and it would be foolish of me today to try to present to you kind of an exhaustive explanation of all of the routes that patient data uh, transit even in the United States and much less globally. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about kind of the, the broad buckets um, of uh, who is collecting um, health care data um, and patient data and then specifically focus on a very thin layer of the corporate, uh, of the um, commercial uses. Um, so, 
as we've already talked about today um, in many other panels, um, there uh, are two kind of large buckets that we could think about, um, and that would be uh, the public sector, so national governments, uh, local governments, um, public health departments, institutes, um, uh, taxpayer-funded um, health and medicine initiatives such as the NIH in the United States or the VA in the U.S. Um, or the NHS in the U.K. Um, but as we've already discussed today, that bucket is completely porous. I mean, there are a lot of um, public-private partnerships within the, this kind of public sector bucket. Um, so, um, and then the other bucket um, would be the, um, the private sector bucket, um, which resides, of course, primarily in the case that I'm going to talk today, um, uh, multinational corporate interests in, in um, patient data. Um, so the Googles and Amazons of the world would go into this bucket, but also kind of uh, less known, less visible to um, patients, but also to uh, clinicians, uh, people like Experian, or corporations like Experian also go into this bucket. Okay, so like I said, I am going to focus uh, primarily on a very thin layer of the commercial sector bucket. Um, and uh, so, um, and I'll talk a little bit about why all data is considered health data in the eyes of um, multinational corporate interests in, in patient data. Um, but for the moment, I will talk about Google um, and Alphabet. Um, so in possession of about 90% of the Global South, South's market share in data analytics, with 2 billion active Android device users worldwide, and with more, with more than 200 acquisitions of smaller um, like AI companies, data companies, um, since 2006 alone, um, such as uh, Alphabet, uh, Alphabet's DeepMind company uh, is a prime example of, of that kind of acquisition, Google is by far the world's most powerful stakeholder in patient data. Um, and as Susan has shown, and as a, my colleague Vincent Duclos has shown, um, the power, that kind of power over data does not necessarily result in um, better outcomes or improved outcomes for patients. So for example, um, my colleague Vincent Duclos uh, shows that the failure of something like Google, Google flu trends was driven by using globally source, sourced search behavior as a proxy for health data. So this is one of the main things that most of these multinational corporate interests in health data do is that they use, they consider all data uh, as data that can make health inferences on millions of people. Um, and so that's one example. Another kind of global leader who um, uh, possesses and controls patient data uh, would be Amazon. And so um, last year, Amazon made a public announcement along with their partners, JP Morgan Chase and Berkshire Hathaway to co-found Haven, which is a healthcare company that will leverage, uh, it's a healthcare nonprofit company that will leverage um, the combined 1.2 million, uh, the data of, they're all of these corporations combined 1.2 million employees um, in order to provide uh, healthcare services to their employees. Uh, with the famed surgeon and medical journalist Atul Gawande heading this new venture. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, Microsoft and IBM and IBM Watson, which claim IBM Watson, for example, um, claims to have 250 million patient records um, as part of their data assets that can be, that are sold um, to um, anyone who wants to buy them. Uh, so um, all of these companies have their origins and uh, their kind of legislative um, 
support here in the U.S. Um, so, but these are kind of very uh, well-known, famous uh, companies. Lesser known, more invisible companies would be people like, or companies like Experian. Um, or people like uh, IQVIA, which used to be IMS Health. And so uh, again, uh, as the strategy for a lot of these companies is to just like Google bought up 200 acquisitions since 2016, IQVIA, when it was IMS Health, buys up these small kind of startup companies, data companies, to kind of build all of the IP assets and all of the data assets that these smaller companies hold um, in order to kind of create a monopoly on this data. So IQVIA, when it was IMS Health, um, and this again is about the kind of legislative relationship in the United States uh, that um, these companies have. Um, in 2011, there was a very famous Supreme Court case, Sorrell versus IMS Health, that basically declared, um, I have to kind of backtrack for a moment, um, IMS Health slash uh, IQVIA um, collect and sell um, prescription data um, to Big Pharma. And so one of the, um, the uh, interests within kind of that larger node are um, pharmacies across the United States. So pharmacies will have all of the script data in their databases um, that come from doctors. So, okay, thank you. Um, so they sell um, uh, um, pharmacies will sell this data onwards. And so there was a large case where a pension fund uh, in the United States found out that their prescription data were being sold um, and fought IMS Health in the, and it went up to the Supreme Court. The Sup Su Supreme Court decision declared that the data that was owned by the pharmacy, so the data were not owned by the patients that the drugs were prescribed for, the data were not owned by the doctors who prescribed the, the drugs, but rather it was owned by the innovators of that data. And the innovators of the data, the innovation is basically done by de-identifying records and by doing analytics on the, on the data. So those are the owners of the data. And as such, this is protected free speech. So they won the case on a First Amendment argument um, that this is protected free speech and they can sell this data onwards. Okay, so very quickly, um, there are also, you know, large kind of multinational uh, informatics companies such as LexisNexis that sell decisioning data products to healthcare providers in order to do risk assessments on, um, on whether or not a patient will be compliant uh, with doctor's orders or whether they will be readmitted into the hospital, which again in the U.S. context um, with value-based healthcare which is all about kind of making uh, a broken, um, fragmented capitalist system more efficient by basically imposing austerity measures on, on hospitals and patients. Um, basically, there's a, a huge focus now um, on bringing down readmission rates to hospitals and doing, and doing kind of uh, risk assessment analysis on things like claims data um, from health insurers. Um, so um, so th these third-party companies come in like LexisNexis and buy millions of, claim of, of claims data from health insurers in order to do these predictive models that they're going to resell back to healthcare systems to make their systems more efficient. Um, okay, very quickly. Um, so uh, some of the biggest players um, in who's collecting and commodifying patient data are uh, health insurers. Um, and again, they um, 
spin out companies based on essentially based on all of the millions of claims data that are submitted to them through their patients and so one of them is Optum and Optum was the company last week I know a lot of people brought up the the racist algorithm it was Optum's algorithm so this is a proprietary algorithm and basically the researchers who were all like emergency department physicians who were doing kind of data science used that algorithm and used the data from that algorithm but the data of that is used in that algorithm are claims data which is basically about getting paid for insurers to get paid or to pay health care providers instead of looking at health data of the patients so because of that the algorithm produced because our health care system is unequal and because it's based on capitalism it kind of produces these unequal results okay so I'll just quickly quickly so I didn't talk about HIPAA I didn't talk about high tech but these are acts that were passed in the United States which were essentially collaboratively written by lobbyists and by and by legislators to basically ensure that a lot of the the data that are being pooled and and they are being pulled into lakes and oceans I mean this is how they're talked about and kind of a guarantee that these these lakes and oceans will exist but also that they will be tapped or kind of drawn upon by these multinational corporate interests and as someone like the work that Maureen had talked about in our previous panel that things like technologically based health care interventions such as M health deployed in Ghana or India double as opportunities to open new target markets sites of data extraction and and they these corporations all have significant stakes in developing health care technologies that are reliant upon the extracted data of billions of patients globally and what these systems are or what these dynamics are doing these corporations are doing is basically forcing patient data and patients themselves to conform to the marketing market logics of globalized biocapitalism but logics that I argue originate in American medical capitalism thank you thank you very much Mary for a very fascinating and insightful presentation into the commercialization of health data and be interesting to know more about how the owners you said the owners and innovators of patient data claim that that this that the collection empowers patients we can discuss that further but now we're moving on to our final presentation by Sridhar please welcome Sridhar who is a senior lecturer in global health and philosophy at King's College London and he is going to talk about the relationship between social justice and health data thank you very much it's a really great honor and privilege to be included so a couple of things one is that I'm incredibly nervous because I bought this fancy computer in order to make everything go better but it's not working and so please forgive me if I freak out or suddenly start rambling as I make things up but I've got my notes on here so I just to sort of give a brief introduction so I'm an interdisciplinary trained sort of academic and my official I guess 
self-presentation is that I'm a political philosopher and I work on uh, global health and philosophy, particularly around justice and issues around global health justice and theories of justice and the place of health and how do we incorporate health more into philosophical conceptions of justice. Um, so the second thing is that uh, I'm going to, as, as many of you have done a beautiful job of presented something a very thick and, and rich conception into 15 minutes, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that. Um, but so I'm going to give you a very brief um, sort of run through pieces of, of what I hope will be uh, the article that I've agreed to, uh, sort of the, the, for the special issue that I've agreed to edit. And I hope that many of you will contribute and respond to and add to your presentations in the issue. Um, so let me just jump right in. Uh, 15 minutes, right? We get 15 minutes. Okay, so I've got my clock. Let's see how this goes. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a story uh, about um, Theranos. Uh, I don't know if many of you know this story, but I uh, think it's mandatory viewing for everybody in this room. The, it's an HBO documentary that I'm recommending. It's called uh, The Inventor in, in Search of Blood or Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. Um, it was recently released, and it's, uh, I've watched it a couple of times now, and I think it's an incredible morality tale about lots of different things, but I want to focus in on one specific thing. So let me just give you, for those of you who are not aware of it, so Theranos is a, is a, was a company in Silicon Valley, one of the, the most hyped and most sort of incredibly known companies, and it was run by a young woman who uh, started the company at 19 years old. She uh, dropped out of Stanford, uh, and then she started this company, and it was going for a number of years. Uh, and she was compared to Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and uh, some people were, you know, sort of sort of incredible comparisons. And she also herself compared to herself to these individuals and thought of herself. <laughs> no, no, it's not funny. It's not funny. So she also thought of herself as a as a visionary, and her board was made up of incredible people. So she had generals, uh, Schultz, and other people. So this was one of the most stuff. Um, and by the end of 2018, when the company was dissolved, um, it, was, it had spent a billion dollars. Uh, and, so, and then in 2018, uh, she and her ex-CEO and also secret boyfriend, uh, Ramesh Sunny Banvali, uh, were charged with fraud and then are facing 20 years of imprisonment. This is the largest fraud in Silicon Valley or in the history of Silicon Valley. Now, the question in the HBO documentary, and I think everybody agrees, is that she did not set out to commit fraud. She did not intend to. She was. She was. Uh, in, she initiated a company in true faith, and she was continuing it in true faith. Something went wrong, and I, I urge you to watch uh, this documentary. And so, the basic premise of Theranos is that um, it's a word that combines therapy and diagnosis. And what she wanted to achieve was that for all of us who go and do medical tests, you have to give vials and vials of blood, and she wanted to remove that. Uh, intense process of drawing blood and the fear that people have. And she wanted to miniaturize it, which is that from a thumb prick, that amount of blood that you can take out, she would then invent a little uh, vial in which there was nanotechnology. And that vial would then be inserted into a, a little black box that uh, you could put on. And then it would carry out 200 medical tests. And, and so the idea was that it would be an incredibly painless but uh, profound information generation that would allow us to uh, know more about our health. And she used words that I would use, and I think many of you used, and she said, um, our work is about the belief that access to action actionable health information is a basic human right. And that was the, the language that she used, and she believed it, and she proceeded to set up a company and convince lots of people that this was achievable. So, but what I want to focus on is that in this HBO documentary, there is a behavioral economist that's interviewed, and he was brought into the company for another reason. But he was interviewed, and he talks about an experiment that he did separately, which is that uh, he works on motivation and human motivation. And so he gave people an experiment, which was that he gave them a die. So two dice, one die. And he said, okay, I'm going to pay you for the number that comes up on your die. And so what I need you to do is basically pick, when you roll the die, uh, you can pick either the bottom number or the one that's on the top. Don't tell me which one you're going to pick. 
Just keep it in your mind. Just decide what you want, bottom or top, before you know it. And then roll the die. And then tell me what the number was. And so what happened was that when you collected all this information of people, they, it turned out that they were all statistically more lucky than they should be. Right? So they were somehow statistically getting higher numbers than the die should have given them. So what this meant was that they were lying. Right? So then what he did is that the same thing, except this time he connected them to a lie detector test. And, and so what he did was, I want you to do the same thing, not the same people, but he did the same thing. And again, they were statistically more lucky than they should have been, so they were getting paid more than they should have been. But the lie detector machine could detect when people were lying. So you could actually say that, okay, so it actually correlates. So the number of people lying correlates for this higher statistical thing. The innovative and interesting thing that I want you to focus on is that he then said, now I'm going to give a charity the money that you win, right? So do the same thing, roll the die, pick bottom or top, and then you tell me whether what the number was, but the money goes to a charity. And in this case, uh, they were also statistically more significant in terms of being lucky, but the lie detecting machine could not tell that they were lying. Right? So there's something here about human beings and the goal that they are interested in achieving and whether there's any tension in their brain about what they're doing and the goal that they're trying to achieve. And the reason why he's telling this story is he has something to say about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, right? So I want to leave that story with you, thinking about that, while I go into more of this, uh, this sort of academic sort of talk. So what I want to do is I want to identify the source of big data, what I identify as being the original historical source of big data. I want to give you an, some examples of where I think people were maximizing the existing available data in order to do some very important work, and then identify the reason, the political philosophy questions that come out of that kind of reason, and then uh, move on from there. So for me, uh, and in this group, as obviously you can imagine, any assertion will have a counter critique. So I'm just going to say, for me, the origin of big data really starts with the bills of mortality in London. Uh, in 1603, starting in 1603, uh, in order to identify the impact of the bubonic plague in London, there was something called the bills of mortality or a table of mortality where people were the deaths of people in London parishes were being counted. And what happens then is that the births, uh, the deaths of people who are being buried, because it's Christian and you bury the dead, in church parishes, was then also connected to the births in those churches, right? So then what you had is that you suddenly started to have a link between births and deaths. And what happens is that in around 1662, Richard Grant comes along and he starts calculating the probability of dying at different ages. And this is the life table, right? So this then becomes the origin of social statistics. But then this is the origin of different disciplines. This is the origin of demography. This is also the origin of epidemiology. And this is also when ep in economics is also growing as well. And this, is, this information is useful for population size, taxation, census, and as well. So I want to locate our current concern about big data and all the AI computation, all that stuff that's built on this. I want us to understand that from the origins, there's always been multiple different sources and multiple different uses of big data. It's always been about public health. It's also been about social protection. It's also been about economy. It's also been about disease and public health. What's happened now is that as people talk about and trying to define big data is that we've, uh, it's been described as one, the volume has massively increased. The variety of the data has massively increased and the velocity at which the data is being produced has been increased, and it's sort of raising all these different kinds of problems. What 
um, I want to also raise is that the political philosophy and social ethics around that time, around the growth of the life tables of economics, is profoundly influencing how those disciplines have evolved. So, for example, Amartya Sen makes a very useful insightful argument that says there's no real logical relationship between utilitarianism and economics. But this idea of cost efficiency, maximization, preferences, is basically because utilitarianism and economics came together and often the same people were doing pushing forward both disciplines. And we see that, and we can see that today in many of the talks today, where you know, the neoliberal political and economic philosophy is also influencing the way that the use and abuse of digital data is infused, right? So there's both of those happening at the same time. So what I want to uh, sort of do now is to actually say, despite all of uh, despite this sort of growing data over centuries, there's also been very, not but, but and, there's been some very good examples in which individuals have made use of the available data to its maximum extent in order to do some very good stuff. So one is, so Sen's analysis of famines, where he's actually used the available data from a variety of different countries looking at famines and food availability, and basically overturning a theory that's been powerful for at least two, three hundred years to show that it's not the lack of food that causes famines, but it's actually a number of social and economic arrangements that determine famine. The second one I really like is in India, Shirin Gigi Boy did an amazing study about whether religion or region affects fertility. This was a very big issue in the 1990s that somehow Muslim populations and families have more children than Hindu families. And she did a very incredible analysis that showed actually it's the region between North and South that makes more difference than it does about the religion of the, of the family. And the third piece of research that used data to its maximum impact is the Whitehall studies in which uh, Michael Marmot followed all the civil servants and basically showed that health is distributed across the work hierarchy and that work hierarchy is now, we can show that in societies, that actually there's a social gradient of health that parallels the socioeconomic gradient. So these uh, examples of research that, max, that use data to its maximum extent to provide new insights uh, is, is profoundly valuable. But then the question is, and then, so what do we do about it? What does this mean and what do we do? And one of the you know, interesting and, and most uh, useful way is that we use the language, we say, well, we should respect human rights. Uh, and I wish that Philip Boston was here because when I, uh, sort of this, my sort of academic career starts in New York City where I worked at Human Rights Watch and working on AIDS. And the head of Human Rights Watch says, well, we know we actually don't think that there is a human right to health. Right? So what happens when the leading human rights organization actually says that human right we don't think actually exists? Right? And Philip Alston says, you know, forget the philosophical debates, let's just follow the law. And so there's a role for philosophy here in actually providing the philosophical argument for not only human rights, but actually addressing issues that human rights law hasn't addressed and can't address or has not been able to address as well. So, one of the fundamental issues here, and one of the many problems that we have identified in different ways, is what is the right place for social intervention into people's lives in order to help their lives go better? Right? So we might have a very minimal position that says we should leave people alone, and then another position that says that we should help people, we should help people live their lives to the maximum extent. So I suddenly have an out completely came out of time and that 15 minutes went really fast. Um, so the reason I told you the Elizabeth Holmes story is that I think this idea that uh, you know, in terms of having a goal that everybody sort of vehemently believes on is, is, needs to be thought through in a much more way. It's not just something that Elizabeth Holmes has a problem with. I think we all have a problem with that in our own work as well. 
there has to be a new kind of uh, philosophical reasoning that says it's not either deontological where we said this we do because it's the right thing to do or whatever we do whatever is necessary in order to achieve it. There must be something in between that says there is an end in mind but we need to also be very well aware of the process. But that is a philosophical work that hasn't been done yet. We haven't done that. And I think that's the kind of place that ethics has a really important role to play, is to actually provide that kind of reasoning that says, hey, it's not either fully consequential or deontological. There's a way that we can do both of this that actually improves people's lives. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and also for, thank you for uh, bringing us back to the discussions this morning and about the role of philosophy in addressing issues that human rights law may not be able to address. I'm going to invite the other speakers to sit uh, on here and, and also invite Sonia Kittelsen to come up here. Uh, Sonia uh, has a background in international relations and has kindly agreed to provide some comments. Sonia uh, has uh, is a uh, has been a member of the conference program committee and has been involved in co-editing the special issue that came out of last year's journal, and we look forward to hearing your comments. Yes, um, thank you for the opportunity to give some feedback or some comments, and thank you for a really interesting panel. Can you hear me now? Yeah, for a very interesting panel and a, an interesting day on, a, on the whole. Um, I think this... Uh, panel brought up a lot of, they can't hear me? Is that better? <laughs> Sorry. Um, a lot of interesting themes around uh, data knowledge and ownership. Um, and I was thinking about, I was kind of reflecting on, on um, our role as researchers in kind of navigating uh, this space. Um, on the one hand, I thought the, the presentations as a number of presentations have done today, kind of um, raised the kind of questions of the opportunities and limitations presented by this type of data collection and use in addressing or kind of um, uh, um, um, improving health outcomes. Um, and uh, yeah, um, sorry, I'm just going to collect myself. Yeah, in particular with respect to um, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> no, I don't have a slide. I just uh, um, with respect to um, um, the the kind of um, sorry, I've just completely frozen. I'm just um, I was thinking back to the Ebola the Ebola case study, um, and and also uh, I think it was more about how this kind of data sometimes is kind of abstracted from kind of social realities um, and lived experiences of individuals, um, but how it's then used and mobilized in ways that aren't obvious that they're actually improving health outcomes, which was raised a number of times today. Um, and so I was thinking about this raises really interesting questions about how we kind of identify data um, that's useful, the kind of privilege, how certain data is privileged over others, um, who has the power to kind of um, say what certain data means and, and how it's going to be used. Um, and I also thought about how it might say something about what kind of alternative forms of data knowledge uh, or collection would be interesting or relevant in this domain, particularly with respect to what you spoke to, um, Susan, about the role of anthropology in the Ebola response. Um, and it also makes me um, think about what the use of this uh, data, this kind of algorithm of big data, is for um, Certainly, a theme that's come up often is that we have big um, co companies in the private sector is heavily involved in this space, and there are competing interests here, including, you know, expansion into different markets, the commercialization of, of, um, of the commodification of health data, and things like that. Um, and so, also, when it comes to how we go about researching this. Um, one of the things that comes up that didn't you know, didn't speak to too much in these presentations, but have come up in some of your articles that I've, I've read, is is about how the complexity of of knowing how this data is collected, um, how it's um, kind of um, um, distributed amongst different actors, um, how these algorithms are 
kind of configured uh, the assumptions underpinning them and the fact that oftentimes the, this data is owned by private actors and are not kind of openly accessible to be tested or, or um, kind of evaluated by people um, outside of these the, the, the private companies that own them. And so then I wonder as our role as, as social science researchers or researchers from other domains, how we go about um, studying the kind of power relations underpinning the use of this data, um, the, the, the limitations and um, the possibilities that it presents in terms of um, moving towards health equity. Um, and also, um, uh, if our goal is to um, kind of push an agenda forward that's, that's focused on looking at how we can harness technologies for the public good. Um, how do we go about doing that um, um, uh, given the kind of various unknowns about how this data is gathered, interpreted, um, and disseminated, um, and how accurate this data is? Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much, Sonia. And I think I think the question of how we research uh, these issues is extremely important. It makes me think also about you know in Europe at least we're talking about the open science revolution and how does this how does this align? Um, do you do you want to respond to Sonia's comments before we open up, or or should we open up for questions? You look you're shaking your well, heads. So it looks like you have. Yeah, I mean I can just especially to your last point, um, and it also came up um, with a couple of other presenters. I think like. Marine and possibly Nora's presentations, where I, I was thinking about um, my own work, and, and you know, I'm I basically I, I research. Um, I'm kind of in right like my current work. I'm researching these powerful actors and how they are accessing and mobilizing uh, patient data, um, and. One of the discussions that's happening in the United States um, in terms of how do patients kind of take back ownership of the data that um, derive from their bodies, right? And so the discussion, because we've completely capitulated to the market here, um, activists, lawmakers, um, are all talking about understanding patients. We need to teach patients, A, that they're consumers, and B, that um, if they want to, um, if their data are valuable, they have to see their data the way these corporations see their data, as commodities that can be extracted and sold. And so the answer, uh, in terms of like, at least in the US context, um, about this kind of problem about who owns our data, the answer, um, unfortunately, here has been, well, patients should be paid for their data. They don't have consent to, to their data being extracted in the first place because when you go into um, any um, uh, U.S. healthcare system, uh, be it um, public, publicly funded or um, a private hospital, you have you be, you have no rights um, to your to consent to um, how your data are extracted and used. Um, that was eliminated. Consent was eliminated in 1997 in, uh, under HIPAA, um, and so. We don't, uh, patients in the US, uh, as long as we participate in healthcare, um, we don't, already we don't consent to what's happening. But now what we're being told is that, well, uh, you haven't consented, but now you need to see yourselves as commodities um, or as producers of a commodity um, and that you should have value, uh, that part of that value come back to you. Um, I don't think that that's a good answer for for any of us, but you know, it, that was what was kind of occurring to me about like harnessing data for public good. In the in the U.S. context, it's the public good becomes 
you know, like there is, there are no public goods in the U.S. anymore. <laughs> there aren't. <laughs> there are no more. There's no understanding uh, of us being part of a commonwealth. And uh, yeah, there are no no longer public goods that we all have to see ourselves as commodities, and that um, we have to be very neoliberal. We have to be the neoliberal subjects that are always kind of investing in our ourselves um, in order to participate in this. Thank you. We've got uh, two questions here. We'll start with Antoine. Yes. I, I would just wanted to pick up on a theme that popped up in several of your presentation, and that is the intention. Like, uh, doing good through data, somehow, Shrida, you showed it that it was okay to lie. We don't have a problem in lie detector. Uh, if we want to do good, give the money to the charity. Susan, you showed that we want to do good, but it has opportunity cost. But somehow it was okay in the mainstream discourse to experiment on these things. So I want to ask, in terms of governance aspect, how do we handle this? And how, and how is it that we get so viscerally um, repulsed by the commercialization of our data, but that it's okay somehow to uh, experiment with our data to do good. And how do we fight that? And how do we uh, create some regulations around this? Thank you. Susan, do you want to uh, respond to that? Well, I don't think that all data um, populations are created equal. By <laughs> They simply aren't. And um, I might get at that in a different way by saying that um, one of the strategies that we might take up is a decentering of the technology itself, the um, extractive technologies themselves, so that when we do these forensics about how the work that data do, that we might think about uh, whether or not something is built from the ground up so that it's built for purpose, or is it a, a, a fit for purpose would be kind of a second level of um, okay. But the third level, which is actually how it often operates, is a find a purpose so that these apps are, are kind of developed outside of the realm of human need. And so um, when we uh, keep people front and center and actually talk about uh, and, and make that the focal point so that we're dealing with a kind of uh, reciprocity uh, that uh, Khadija was talking about this morning. Um, I, I do think that it has to be about liberating uh, the, the technology and the data from these non-human-centric um, activities, uh, simply because it's, and you can see the trajectory, it's going to create an unkinder and unkinder future. Uh, where people just are removed, more, are participating in the removal of themselves from uh, really what is wonderful and juicy and uh, delightful about being a human. And that involves the relationships, particularly when you're ill, uh, that are, are healing and nurturing as opposed to these kinds of uh, experiences of ill health where um, you're just so disadvantaged, um, and it's so um, money money dependent. I mean that, you know, we have to ask the question about what is the world that we want, and I think that the world that we want may require that we ha we go through exercises where we are decentering the technology and decentering the data long enough to figure out what would it actually look like if we made um, human. And I, I hope this doesn't sound too idealistic because I think that it's the only thing left for us to do. Um, is to do the forensics on the technology, be able to have the co conversations with people in Silicon Valley or Washington, D.C. or Ottawa or Geneva that says, we understand how this data works, and it has this and this and this kind of effect. Social science is showing this. My research is showing this. And uh, take me seriously, because it's going to take us to a kind of uh, end that is, is really too inhuman and, in fact, a bit cruel. And I just have to believe that that's not where we want to go. Thank you, Susan. Lots of hope and social science ability to account. <laughs> Trudeau, you wanted to respond. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that fantastic question. I think, um, so one of the, one of the things that, uh, the excruciating thing about doing ethics is it's not telling people that they are wrong or evil. It's actually discussing different versions of a good idea or a good intention and saying, you know, your good intention and the way that you're providing your arguments 
are going to result in bad things and here's what's going to happen or they're logically incoherent uh, or you know here's an alternative that does better than what you have offered so far and I think we've done a very good job today of actually showing the real world consequences of certain kinds of thinking or an analysis of a bigger thing so I think um, that's you know that's what I, I think ethical reasoning or philosophy is about there's different methodologies of being able to do it I think there's a separate thing which I am still learning and this is a lifelong journey which is that you can provide a better argument but it doesn't mean it's going to be taken up mm -hmm, absolutely right yep. and and so there's it's lots the of different <laughs> strategies that we have to employ in which we have the ability to present the better uh, argument or the critique that's actually accepted. And one of the loveliest phrases that I keep remembering is that no one wants to learn something that's going to threaten their income, right? So, or something like that. It was sort of something like that. It's like somehow people has, you know, can understand something that is going to threaten their way of living. And I don't know how to go around it. And those are, I think, why the political realm to talk about ideas is a very useful uh, way to Thank you very much. Okay, so we have uh, five minutes left and three questions. So I suggest we take the three questions or comments uh, together and then give uh, each of the panelists an opportunity to respond to what they think is pertinent. Please. So I had a lot of different thoughts sparked by the, the speakers on the panel. And I don't want to pick on one company, but I'm going to pick on one company. Uh, <laughs> So Google acquired Fitbit for two billion dollars. I can tell you that I'm working with um, uh, Wall Street investors, and they are putting that kind of data together already to come up with models for uh, how much risk there is involved with particular kinds of investments. So that's already happening. Yeah, and that happens. I mean, my my previous book, I, I talk about that. Um, the you know the extent. I mean, basically, Experian. I interviewed a data broker who basically said our panel really should have been called Experian owns us, not Google. <laughs> because Experian owns all of the data about our debt. And that's really valuable. So they put together, um, I mean, Experian has Experian Health. Um, and because, again, like I was trying to kind of reiterate with Optum, um, uh, all of these companies, because they exist in the US and it's a capitalist system, medical system, by putting together the financial data and the health data together, um, they are making all sorts of kind of inferences and predictions yep. about things that you would never think that they could do, but this is what they're attempting to do. And then uh, currently I'm doing research at a, at a medical school in that hospital system um, where, so I'm, I'm working with public health researchers and health informaticians. Um, and there's this whole thing now that they're after social deter determinants of health data, but those data are being sold to them by places like Experian, 
um, and then Google. they're making service delivery decisions, right? right? I have yeah. two more questions, anyway. and no more yep. time, yes. so, so please. Yeah, I think here we took the mic, but I, my voice is pretty loud. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I think it's more for the live stream. It's a problem. But this one works. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, we made a departure from the, um, the theme of the, the particular session, but I'm really worried about the social pathology as it relates to technology and not data specifically. Um, I teach public health, and I'm seeing a, a social decline um, whereby People are actually, yeah, people seem to be mo more concerned about providing that data because the companies seem to have made it irresistible to provide data for them. And you have no choice but to provide that. Um, you know, is there any way we can actually, um, how to put it, craft our agenda as it relates to, to the digital age in such a way that people take back control of their, um, you know, their lives, so to speak? Thank you. Uh, Desmond, please, final question. Okay, yeah, a very naive question to round off to, um, <laughs> to Susan, but I could also put it to Maureen. You know, both of you told stories about high profile, high cost, unsuccessful initiatives, right? And the question is, you know, how do they get away with it? I mean, I know, you know Gates has a very effective sort of control over, <laughs> over the information, but uh, how, the, the, given that these, these are actually demonstrably unsuccessful, or to make it a little less naive, could you say to, was there an extent within Sierra Leone at least where people were criticized in the media or in some other slightly public form where these were people or these initiatives were actually being criticized and, and brought to account? Thank you, Susan, very briefly and then I'm gonna let everyone have a final word. Uh, For 30 seconds. They, they don't know about it. The same way that a lot of people um, in any of our communities don't know about the way the data is being used. That's the short of it. They don't know. How would they know? People aren't talking about it. They aren't necessarily doing the kind of forensic um, diagnostics to be able to explain how data is being collected or used. Samia, do you want to say something? Okay. Do you have a final comment, Mary? Um, I guess uh, just to back up, Susan, I mean, just like, you know, I mean, I can barely, I've been researching this industry for um, since since I was harmed by this industry in 2011. Um, so for the last, you know, my life has been totally dedicated now to studying kind of the biopolitics of data. And I can barely, I mean, it's so overwhelming that, I mean, I can barely um, understand kind of the complexity of this, of this network um, and who's collecting what and what they're doing t with our data. All I know is that we don't have <laughs> Uh, you know, we basically don't have any rights uh, in the data economy. We don't. On that note. <laughs> um, so I have a random but I think important um, request, which is that, um, so the Theranos story really sort of came to point is that, uh, you know, Elizabeth Holmes wasn't alone. She had a CEO and an ex-boyfriend named Sunny, um, but Bun Bali. But what also brought to mind is that Silicon Valley is full of Indians and full of Indian men. And most people, the race and race politics in America is that only white and black people exist, right? Meanwhile, Silicon Valley is full of Indians and their values are infused. Most people, when they think of tech bros, think of like some young white coder, but it's not, right? And so Google is full of Indians, it's overrepresented in the values. And I think some of you should look at the ethnography of these Indian immigrants working in health and digital technology and what's going on and you know, what their notions of you know, aims and values and how that's influencing this, and how doing good and making money and the immigrant dream, how that's influencing the way all of these things are coming together. And I think that's really could be insightful and helpful. Thank you very much. I think uh, what all of these discussions really bring home is the need for really serious in-depth research into, into processes that are really bewildering in their complexity. And I think this latest point about the way that new the different kinds of data intersect and different kinds of ownership are you know, difficult to, to reveal the, the obscure relationships and also the different values from different kinds of people. It's really, 
it's good because there's a lot of business for ethnographers in, in this uh, field, but also we really need these conversations across... across uh, I mean, for audience. example, if I could just talk about this conference <laughs> in and of itself, right? We had to upload our close. speeches to Google Docs, and if you read the terms of reference in Google Docs, Google Docs now owns our pr presentations. Yes. I think that's a perfect place to end. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, and I remind, um, uh, before we thank the panel, I want to remind uh, the speakers to join us for a very brief meeting about uh, the potential to put together a publication on some of these yeah, wonderful and presentations. That will be in the room next door. You go out of here and the glass doors. Is there oxygen okay. in that room? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much to our wonderful panel. And